Good afternoon and welcome to episode three of the Gradcracker webinar series. Today we are joined by engineering and scientific technology company Renishaw. So welcome Renishaw. I'm really looking forward to introducing you to the graduate lead Becca, Pete and grads Kate, Annabelle and Jonathan. Pete is the electronics graduate stream coordinator and is going to give us an insight from a management point of view what makes a good intern and grad at Renishaw and therefore what will give you the grad cracker audience that special um, special edge to make you succeed. So starting with you Pete can you just give us a bit of an overview to who Renishaw is? Hi good afternoon good afternoon everyone um, my name is Pete Leonard I'm electronics design manager um, well Renishaw a FTSE 250 company based in the UK we're transforming manufacturing efficiencies using um, our high quality instrumentation, maximizing research capabilities, and we're also improving medical procedures and patient outcomes. Our mission is to address design, manufacturing, and metrology systems, which is the measurement of, or the science of measurement. And basically we're making the highest quality, highest reliability uh, instruments to improve manufacturing outcomes. So we've been around for a little while. In fact, we've been uh, in, um, in existence for over 45 years now, and we still have a very strong chairman, Sir David McMurtry, who looks after our, our organization and often uh, encourages us to develop many different products. At the moment, um, we're uh, turning over about 500 million and we've got just over 4,000 employees worldwide. We've yeah. actually sell in 36 different countries. And to be honest, we make an awful lot of investment into research and development, over 76 million last year. So our customers exist from aerospace to automotive to electronics uh, manufacturers and even into healthcare. So we make instruments which can be motorized, which move on the machines. We make instruments that actually can measure on cutting machines. So if you had a coordinate measuring, uh, sorry, a CNC machine, which is a numeric controlled uh, machining center, you could instrument them up with our uh, technology. We also have gauging systems and we have uh, additive manufacturing systems, which means that we can actually print things made from metal. We also have, as I've suggested, a medical side, which means that we have medical uh, robots. And also we do look at um, spectroscopy, which is analyzing materials and science in that respect. Um, we also have encoders, which um, instrument uh, linear axes or rotary axes. And to be honest, we make everything in-house in terms of designing, manufacturing in the UK. So everything from a small encoder, which could fit in your hand, to uh, a full-size machining center, which would fill a room and be able to be uh, capable of printing a large objects in metal. So basically, that's Renishaw. Um, we're headquarters in the UK, and our main headquarters is in Gloucestershire, which is between Gloucester and Bristol. Thanks very much. Wow, that was a good introduction. That was brilliant. <laughs> Some of those words that you could just said, I could never do, say those in a webinar when I'm quite nervous. So thank you very much, right. Pete. Just, I can never top that. So what we're going to do now is shake up the webinars a little bit and we're going to do the quick fire fact section round. So Pete's given us a fantastic introduction to who Benishar is. Now I'm going to go around everybody else, including Pete, um, and ask about your um, top facts that people might not know about. So Becca, I'm going to start with you. Hi everyone, so I'm Becca, I'm the graduate lead here at Renishaw. Um, my fun fact is that a couple of years ago we designed and built from scratch an interactive grommet sculpture. Um, so some of you might be familiar with the, um, the grand appeal that Bristol Children's Hospital run. Yeah. Um, they run it, they've run it for a couple of years now and it was a really exciting opportunity for us because there was only three companies asked to build one of these grommet sculptures. Yeah. We called him Grommetronic. Um, <laughs> of course he did. He had um, 5,000 separate LED lights on him. He had over 10,500 lines of code all written in Python. Um, and he also has 3D printed parts. So his tail was 3D printed, his toenails, um, and also the collar um, around his neck was 3D printed with little sculptures of um, landmarks around Bristol um, inside the collar as well. So his eyes move, his tail wags, and he lights up loads of different colours depending on which touchpads you touch. 
Um, so it was really, really interactive and really engaging. Um, Gormatronic, he was set up in the M Shed in Bristol for people that might be familiar with the museum. He was there for a couple of months and now he proudly sits in our demo area and it's one of the highlights of me showing people around. I love showing him Gormit, <laughs> so there's my fun fact. Becca, the question is though, when, when are you going to make Wallace? Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. who knows? <laughs> that's the fun fact for the next webinar. Dun, Absolutely. Dun, dun. <laughs> You're confirmed. Thanks, Becca. Great fact. Um, Jonathan, I was just deciding, I was like, who should I go to next? Jonathan, ooh, I'm going ooh, to you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hello. Um, yeah, my name's Jonathan. I'm a mechanical design engineer. And uh, my fun fact is that Renishaw helped manufacture the bike used by the British cycling team in uh, what was just the Tokyo Olympics. Um, so as Pete mentioned, um, there's a lot of additive manufacturing, which is a uh, metal 3D printing effectively. And because of the kind of flexibility and complexity of the parts that printing can achieve, you can print it off much lightweight and kind of bespoke or like uniquely designed, tailored to the rider. Um, so I think the example was, I think it was handlebars in particular um, that they helped contribute. Um, so yeah. That's Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you, Jonathan. Very of the moment. Um, Annabelle, on to you. My fun fact is a lot less technical than some of <laughs> it's these. It's fine. To be quite honest, <laughs> Annabelle, I have no idea what Jonathan and Becca were talking about. So you go. Uh, oh, <laughs> well, you'll get this one then. My fun <laughs> fact is that Renishaw has a hot air balloon. Oh, um, <laughs> and a good couple of years ago, it was involved in a world record um, to get the most number of hot air balloons from the UK over to Cali. So that is my fun fact. Renishaw has a hot air balloon. That is a world record holder. I oh, like that. Because I've seen your pictures on the hub mm. of the Renishaw balloon, and I just thought it was just a nice little promotional thing, but it's actually yeah. yours, is it? It's an actual oh. thing, yeah. Actual so can you book rides? Can I have a ride, please? I, <laughs> if I find out, I'll let you know. I hope so. I'm coming. <laughs> Let's have a trip to Calais. <laughs> Only shows my client, me and Becca are first on that. On that <laughs> I haven't been oh, on yet. Yeah. <laughs> Join the list. Um, thanks, Annabelle. Kate, on to you, my love. Uh, so my fact's quite similar to Jonathan's. So um, Renishaw uh, contributed to the design of uh, the titanium nose tip and custom-made steering wheel for Bloodhound, which is a car designed to break uh, the land, current land speed record. Um, yeah. So the steering wheel is designed specifically for the driver and the green's hands so that it fits him perfectly and only him um, so that he has you know the best chance at, at steering and uh, yeah the best performance for the car. Brilliant. When is the next world record attempt? Does anybody know? I'm just asking you this off the cuff. Oh I didn't look that up. Um, yeah, that's, fine. That's, that's fine Kate we'll, 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 we'll put something on the hub if you ever want to watch World Rim breaking records um, thank you very much Kate and Pete on to you I think the record uh, attempt is probably next year to be honest but oh, uh, so I, I was going to mention that we do print things like um, bones and teeth but um, actually we have a Raman spectrometer which is basically a, a, a machine that we develop for medical industry so it, it analyzes materials and uh, chemicals and it's being used to not only analyze drugs and uh, pharmaceutical uh, tablets but it's also being used to identify the age of paintings um, because you can actually identify the, the actual makeup of the oils and uh, mm -hmm. the materials that are actually in the fabric of the uh, canvases. Um, and one last thing it, it, it can um, uh, look for is um, not only the, the pharmaceutical drugs, but shall we say uh, other drugs that you might not be <laughs> aware of, but uh, it can certainly identify any, any sort of material. So that's my fun fact. I think I've seen something about that because I watched a program called Fake or Fortune and the, what they do is analyse paintings and things like that and they can analyse like, when the painting was, was made and the types of oils and the things they use. So that exactly. would be something similar. Exactly right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. God, I love these webinars. <laughs> um, yeah. Right. So I think you all did a little bit of an introduction. Thank you, Pete. Sorry, my manners. I was getting too excited. No problem. Um, so um, I think we all did a little bit of an introduction about what you studied at, at university. So can we just kind of go back the back through the room to the to the grads? Um, so what you studied, where you went to university, and what is your role at Venishaw? So Jonathan, I'm going to go back to you. Cool. Um, so I went to the University of Birmingham. Um, and I'm from Bristol, so that was like a move away from home for me. Yeah. Um, and I did a master's in mechanical engineering with an industrial year placement. So that was a five year course, um, mm -hmm. 
kind of three years, then my placement out in um, manufacturing, and then finished off the master's when I came back. Thank uh, you. And then, um, yeah, I'm a mechanical design engineer. Super. Thank you, Jonathan. On to you, Annabelle. Um, I went to Swansea University and did a Bachelor's of Engineering with a year in industry and my degree was in medical engineering. Thank you. Um, and I am now on the Manufacture Engineering grad scheme. Superb. And Kit? Uh, so I studied uh, Integrated uh, Electrical and Mechanical Engineering Masters um, at Bath um, and now I'm on the Electronics grad scheme um, at Renshaw. Thank you, Kit. If we've got time, everybody, at the end of the webinar as well, I have written a note down. I do want to go back to Pete and ask about the printed um, bones and teeth, because I think that's going to be exciting. So yeah. if we've got time, that's definitely going to be something that we round off with at the end, because, yeah, I'm quite excited about that one. And um, so thank you, guys, for the introduction. And um, just again, to give the audience a bit of an overview about our relationship with Ren Shaw. So Rennie Shaw advertises all of their placements and graduate opportunities on Gradcracker and has done for the last nine years. Um, I think that's how long we've known each other, Becca, something along those lines. Um, um, for me, it's, yeah, a few, few, few years less, but yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> with yeah. Renishaw, so, definitely. <laughs> um, so what we want to know now, Becca, is uh, just a rough idea, really, of timelines about when you're going to open your opportunities this year. So obviously students can follow you on Gradcracker and get ready to um, apply to your opportunities. Yeah, definitely. So um, definitely recommend following us on the Grad Cracker Hub. Um, our adverts are going to be going live at some point in the autumn, so over the next yeah. few months. Mm -hmm. um, so anyone who's interested, I just recommend keeping an eye on Grad Cracker. You'll get a notification when we do start advertising. Um, but you can also keep an eye on the Renishaw Careers website as well. Um, there'll be regular updates on there. And then when you can apply, that's how you apply through the Renishaw Careers website. Um, we're going to be looking for graduate, industrial placement and summer placement opportunities. Um, so we'll have lots of lots of things advertised and we're looking for people um, who are interested in roles in mechanical, electronics, um, software, embedded software, process engineering, as well as things like um, our commercial schemes, project coordination, manufacturing, operational roles, assembly development, which is a, well, a new um, scheme for us next year or this year coming, um, physical, physics and scientific roles, and then also medical um, devices roles as well, which is another new sort of opportunity for us next year. Brilliant. Thanks, Becca. And so basically, if you're a STEM student, you would look um, at receiving applications from from any STEM student. So if you do have if you're watching today, any STEM background, um, hopefully you will be um, encouraged to follow them like Becca mentioned and then apply to their opportunities as soon as they have opened. Yeah. So Becca, any ideas about timescales? So obviously we're going live sometime in the autumn. Have you got in a rough idea about um, closing dates and when you will, are going to hold your assessment centres? Um, so at the moment, it's it's still to be con um, to be confirmed, but we're probably looking at assessment centres maybe, but just before Christmas, yeah. um, and then opportunities possibly depending on whether you're applying for a graduate scheme or a placement uh, opportunity. Um, ap applications will be open until possibly February next year. Yeah. Um, so there's a quite a, a wide range of of opportunity there probably start opening our applications in November, early November or the end of October. So yeah, keep an eye out. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Thanks very much, Becca. Um, so what I want to do now is just loop back into Jonathan. So everybody and all the grads use Gradcracker um, when looking for your placement and graduate opportunities. Um, but what we like to do, Jonathan, is give the, the audience a bit of an insight about what areas on Gradcracker you found useful and um, when you were applying to your for your role at Rennie Shaw. Mm -hmm. So can you just give the audience a bit of an idea about what you use as on Gradcracker and what you found useful? So just to give some students some hints and tips. Yeah. Um, so it was actually probably the only um, kind of site I used when going through um, looking for jobs of, um, during the final year of my university. Um, and I think for me, I just liked, um, I was quite straightforward with it. I went straight onto like the job search um, kind of tab. Um, and it basically takes you to the section where you can filter everything. Um, yeah. And I just, I think that was definitely, I feel, I feel like being an engineer, I liked it being that clear cut, being like this, I want it in this area and I want it to be in this discipline. Um, so that really helped tailor what my interests were. Um, and then being able to quickly see all the opportunities come up. I think the next best feature was that 
from a glance you could kind of see what um, kind of requirements they needed from you mm -hmm. um, kind of if they were open yet or when they were going to be um, if the site is competitive or if there's a value stated um, and then kind of yeah the requirements yeah um, and then I, I remember when I was using it a lot the next thing I kind of did which I found useful was I'd kind of tab a few of them open and mm -hmm. then you'd be taken to the, the more detailed pages for them yeah. and that, I just really liked the layout it was really clear it said these are all the things that they want from you in like more detail um, and like a lot of the benefits that would come with it um, and then it was just that convenient link uh, that takes you straight to the application so um, yeah. I just found those less trawling through company sites themselves which can be quite hard to uh, find the um, opportunities page on them so yeah. I just found Grand Gradcracker really took out all of that faff basically <laughs> so, um, I, I, yeah I'd say that <laughs> I was just, I was just going to say, Jonathan. I think um, engineers and Yorkshire people are kind of the same mentality. It's just does what it says in the tin. You go yeah. through, find the opportunity, yeah. click through, and apply. Yeah, it was, was. Yeah, <laughs> love it. And um, also, yeah. I say to students when I yeah. promote, I'm like, everything you need in one place. You don't need anywhere, anything else. It's just yeah. bother. Um, next, yeah, I'd exactly. quite like to find out more a bit about your roles, if that's okay. So, um, Kate, I'm going to come to you first. And if you could tell us and the audience a bit more information about what you do on a daily basis in your current role. Um, so I've just come to the first year, end of the first year of my of the electronics grad scheme. Um, the grad scheme stretches over two years and I rotate every six months to a new um, team within the company in a new division. Um, so because of this, my role varies quite a lot. Um, but generally I do a mixture of uh, coding, sort of firmware sort of stuff and also a bit of PCB design. Um, often I'm very involved in the sort of new product um, side of things. Um, but other times I can also play a bit more of a supportive role where I do work to support existing products. Um, Brilliant. That sounds interesting. So how have you uh, found the experience so far? Are you, are you enjoying the role? Are you, have you had any good kind of experience, anything you've experienced maybe you didn't expect, anything like that? Um, so I really like the variation at the moment. Um, yeah. It's really helping me to find out which sort of um, aspects of electronics I enjoy. Um, yeah. So I find that really great. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I, I really like working on new new product design. I, I find that really interesting. Um, you get to work with all sorts of different types of engineer. Um, that's really great as well. Perfect. That sounds really interesting. Annabelle, I'm going to come to you next with a very similar question. Um, what is your role and what do you get up to on a daily basis? Um, so very similar to Kate, I have just finished the first year of my grad scheme out of two and a half years. Um, so I've literally last week switched to a new placement. Right. Um, so I'll, I'll talk about my last one a bit more because I don't know what I'm doing in this one. <laughs> um, so my last one was in the machine shop, um, which was working uh, with the engineering team, fixing programming uh, mill turn machines. Um, so all of our metal piece parts that we make that goes into all of our assemblies that we build. Um, as, as Pete said earlier, we do our manufacturing in the UK. Mm -hmm. So it's one of our one of our big factories where we have uh, a load of lathes and mill turn machines. And um, yeah, I was working with the engineering team, very, very hands on um, learning how to program them, which I'd never done before, uh, learning how to use them, which I'd never done before. Um, so, yeah, it was, it was a really great experience. It was completely new, um, totally out of my comfort zone and so much fun. I really enjoyed it. Um, so that was that was our role. Yeah. Annabelle Milton. I'm thinking like windmills, I'm thinking something okay. turning, what does that actually mean? <laughs> uh, so it's just, it's machines that are able to, to mill metal as well as turn it. So when you're, when you're um, turning, you've got, you've got a metal bar or so, and a little tool comes in and um, attacks it and takes metal off as it's turning around. Right, and if you're milling something, then it's the tool that's spinning and the tool spins come, comes down and right. uh, takes away material that way. So that's all it is, it's just machines that, that cut metal. Can I ask a question? So Annabelle, you mentioned pick me, pick me. Um, Annabelle, you mentioned like the only manufacturing and Pete, you mentioned this as well, is done in the UK. But Pete, you mentioned that you're a global company. So so what what stuff's done globally then? 
Um, well, it's mostly distribution. So it's um, say, selling into the countries that we want customers to be um, aware of what our products. And, and so speaking the local language is much easier than, than having someone from the UK try and sell into a different country. Yeah, perfect. Thanks, Pete. Sorry, Annabelle. Sorry, Jessica. Um, sorry, Annabelle. And then could you tell us a bit about your new role? Like I said, I know you've only been you know, there a couple of weeks, week, but yeah, let, let us know a bit about that. Um, so my new role is in something called vendor assurance. Um, so it is uh, very, very different to my last one. It's like Kate said, huge amount of variety. Yeah. Um, so my role at the moment is is looking at reactive issues that we have um, and taking those back to we have we have a handful of suppliers for um, very, very simple parts where it's just easier to to use a company who are specialized in that rather than setting up our own manufacturing line for it. Okay. Um, so we have my role is to, um, from a technical point of view, communicate with those companies if we're having any reactive issues um, to work with the buyers as well as they're um, purchasing parts and as they're sourcing them and making sure that the parts that we that we are buying in are you know up to the standards that we need them to be um, yeah. and that we're not having any issues down the line with them. So very different. Lots of meetings, um, yeah, lots of customer site visits, uh, sorry, supplier yeah. site visits, which is really great as well. Yeah. And this is the great thing to me about a grad program. And this is what I say to the students as well. You know, you, it's all about those different skills. You know, your first half, so, you know, the, the first placement, all technical, very hands-on, where this is totally learning a whole new skill set, really, isn't it? It's the communication side, being punctual on time, maybe the softer skills as well um, are really going to get developed here. So this is, it, it's a good example of that, isn't it? Where you can, do, would you say you've had much support going into this, this role so far? Yeah, I think so. I mean, the team that I'm working with, there's, there's, uh, it's, it's quite a small team, and then we work very closely with a whole range of others. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it, there's only three of us at the moment. There's another grad who's going to be joining in a couple of months, which oh, would be nice. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we're quite, a, we're quite a close knit team. Nice. Good. That's lovely, isn't it? And Jonathan, come to you. Same question. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, yeah, so um, I'm slightly different. I've actually just come off the grad scheme, so I'm um, now into my permanent position. Yeah, um, yeah. So it's probably easier if I just kind of say what they all had in common. Um, so mm -hmm. kind of uh, as a mechanical engineer, um, it's a lot of computer aided design. Um, so for most uni students, I'm guessing that'll be solid works for them um, or rhinoceros. Um, but I ran assure it's um, it's a Siemens program called NX. So it was a lot of um, learning how to use that. Um, and using that to design new parts, model up assemblies, um, modify them, um, kind of interrogate them for details and so on. Um, so that's kind of the bulk of an like a design engineer's role. But on top of that, I've done a lot of um, coding as well, actually. Um, I think you can kind of get into that if you express the interest. Um, yeah. So if, if, if it's the one thing you hate, don't worry. Um, but <laughs> if you have that passion, then it, it is there and um, it's useful for analyzing a lot of test data. So you get uh, engineers need a lot of data for all sorts of projects, um, whether it be kind of a test rig that you've designed, or if it's the data from a machine um, that you're trialing, or if it's from scanning data from the probes that we use. Um, so there's um, analysis and then designing tests as well to kind of prove uh, kind of hypotheses that we may have about a product, or if we want to check it's up to scratch or what could be improved. Um, so yeah. I've, I've never heard of rhinoceros. I know I've heard of the, 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 the <laughs> like rhinoceros. But oh, yeah, <laughs> I, 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 stop laughing at us, Pete. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I told you it was going to be like this at the beginning. <laughs> so rhinoceros, what so is that is that a, a program? Is that kind of like uh it's I've never used it personally. I just know it's I think it's Rhino 3D, it's just another one of those CAD packages that you can use. Um so lot, I think lots of unis use different ones. I came from a SolidWorks background. Um, so it was new for me learning NX, um, but it was really useful and I actually really liked um, kind of how it's integrated to the company as well yeah it must be nice as well to have um, you know experience the, the full life cycle of a product you know the idea of testing coming up with the initial idea yeah. testing it and then see it right all the way through to the point where Annabelle's at now is you know either selling communicating that product to other people or you know looking after the people that have your products it must be quite good to have all that internal and all that internal knowledge of all the yeah internal. it is useful and um I feel like I've managed to be at each of those different stages mm. throughout my rotations so mm. in one of them I was definitely in the design early concept team 
um, and then yeah, the later on parts were kind of contacting vendors and so on. Um, yeah. And then you've got the testing stages. So um, yeah, it's, you get to be at all the life life cycle of the product. Yeah. Which is oh, how, how I wish as well. Do, can you just imagine though, going home from work and you know, your parents say, oh, we've been doing today. Oh, I'm just working on rhinoceros and just getting, just, <laughs> just, just, just seeing what luck you get. I might try that tonight. I'll just do work a bit of rhinoceros. That's what we're doing. Or going home. I've just been printing teeth. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and burns. Oh, one day, Jess. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Pete, I'm going to come back to you, actually. Um, since the grads have told us about their roles at Renishaw, what do you look for in a student or graduate and how do they set out their future or careers at Renishaw? Yeah, it's amazing. I, mean, I look for these three, obviously, but um, <laughs> what I'm looking for genuinely is, um, well, Renishaw, we're looking for enthusiasm and ambition, yeah. but do remember the basics. So it's the fundamentals of your degrees and your knowledge, which you can build on. Um, knowing the fundamentals is, is the most important thing. And then your higher skills, your, your new uh, introductions to um, uh, higher and different um, machine centres, mm -hmm. Um, design tools, design methodologies, it can all be gained once you've got the basic skills. Yes. So you've heard of lots and lots of um, uh, different varieties of uh, knowledge that um, the graduates here have, have gained. And of course, um, we're empowering those uh, graduates at Renishaw with new design tools, whether it's rhinoceros, no, I don't think it is. It's um, <laughs> Siemens NX or the, um, the, the um, CAD design environments, but we have a, a number of electronic design automation tools, EDA tools, sorry to put an acronym in there, but that's what it is. Um, so they're the ones who, to um, uh, enhance our knowledge about electronic design. So we've got schematic capture, which is um, painting a, a digital image of uh, the knowledge of an electronic uh, concept. Mm -hmm. And then we're creating a printed circuit board and finally an assembly to put that uh, level of knowledge into something that actually works. And of course we need all sorts of disciplines. So we've been talking about electronics, mechanical mm -hmm. and manufacturing disciplines, but that, that reaches out beyond that. It's, it goes towards physicists and obviously the commercial side as well. Um, a couple of top tips. Make sure your CV includes details about you as an individual. I mean, yeah. what, what interests you and what's your passion and motivation? And, and honest, be honest about it. Yeah. Um, obviously, look for opportunities through GradCracker. GradCracker is important to, to sort of be able to facilitate, you know, um, access to, to other companies but obviously it brings us back to to Renishaw and, and you can do some comparisons obviously about what other companies are looking for but the other thing is please apply in plenty of time don't yeah. leave it to the last minute because our deadlines are deadlines for us internally but obviously what happens is if we get good candidates which we do and obviously um, through Gradcracker we get a number of CVs coming through we're going to get inundated we're going to identify mm. those individuals early on before our deadline expires so yeah another top tip is yeah apply early don't leave it to the end yeah that's so Be becca's head's going to fall off because she's just been like it's all the way through <laughs> yeah. a very firm nod there becca <laughs> yeah i mean a, a few other points if that's okay to add to that yeah, as well course, yeah. um i think just it's so important to make yourself stand out so last year we had four thousand applications um, not all through Grad Cracker, but the majority were through Grad Cracker, um, which was great and really strong candidates. But of course, we didn't have 4,000 positions to fill. So, um, you know, it's, it's using things in your in your CV and your cover letter that help you stand out. So not mm -hmm. just saying, well, I studied electronics design or I'm studying manufacturing engineering. You know, that's great. So are, you know, hundreds of other people. But what is it about you that makes mm -hmm. you stand out that means we're going to interview you over those 400 other people that might have applied for that role um so just really making sure that you you make yourself stand out I would say is another really important thing and uh, believe it or not <laughs> um yeah. addressing your cover letter and writing your cover letter to Renishaw so if you're going to do bulk um if you're just going to yeah. do one cover letter you know that's fine but I, ha I see it re very regularly where company names aren't changed you know straight away that's a no 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 yeah. you're obviously not interested in in Renishaw so make sure that you know it is um it's labeled to the right person and if you can show that you've done some research into Renishaw as well in there because that shows you've got a bit of interest in and um that you're keen to, to learn about the company rather than just a generic letter yeah and there's, I mean, even this webinar, Beck, it just gives the students plenty of opportunity to say that they've met, you know, you, Pete, Kate, Absolutely. Annabelle and Jonathan as well. So that that will make it individual yourselves when you're doing your cover letter um, and kind of 
kind of disagree with Becca there. I think you should custom all of your cover letters. You know, it's not one size fits all. I want you to, as the students who are watching, um, you know, be specific to Renishaw. Look at the Hub on Gradcracker. Do your research. Tell Becca and Pete that you've watched this video and you've heard the, 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 of the journeys from Jonathan, Annabelle and Kate. Um, so, yeah, make sure you do that. Lesson number yes. one. Definitely. Do, 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 definitely. That is such a good point. Um, Pete, I'm going to come back to you um, and just want to see how does your role currently kind of um, help the graduates at the moment and, what, and how do you work with them? Oh, that's a tough question to answer. OK, so um, I've been in the business for a number of years, so I've seen products that you're quite right. When you go through a conception of a project and, and you go through that product development, you see it come out of the other end and that's mm -hmm. actually being sold to customers. That's a fantastic sort of feeling. Um, so it, it, I'm relating to um, the graduates because in the business, I'm actually one of the scheme coordinators for um, some of the graduate sessions. So I'm, I'm looking at um, identifying uh, placement opportunities within the business. So I'm trying to um, pair interests with um, product uh, divisions. And what I'm also doing is facilitating training and also um, seminars that we're holding in-house to make sure that we're, uh, again, ensuring that the graduates on our schemes are always being upskilled. So every month we've got something different that's going to be interesting to them and, and it, hopefully it'll be something new. And if it's not new, they can contribute to what they know about um, the, the topic. So I, I, I'm like other scheme coordinators. I'm, I'm a, a, a one of many. Um, so we're all looking after disciplines, uh, different disciplines, I should say. Um, and we're all encouraging um, our graduates to think about their career opportunities to make sure that they are getting the best out of their placement, mm -hmm. um, to encourage them to you know, do the natural things, timekeeping, those sort of things. There's small admin tasks that you have to do, but also um, on the other side of things is make sure that they are enjoying what they're doing and using the skills that they've been sort of taught uh, from the basics, of course, um, and then pulling those through and, and to making sure that they contribute contribute to the business and whatever placement opportunities they've been given um, and I'm there as a, a mentor and a support but so are all my colleagues and we've got a fantastic engineering organization throughout the, the business and every one of us uh, being engineers we're all willing to share our knowledge with um, everyone else who's coming into the business so it, it's a it's a learning environment and obviously what we're trying to do at the end of the day is we'll be making product and why we make product is because we want to make some profit and obviously if we make profit um then everyone's happy i hope <laughs> <laughs> and we can all pay our bills um, <laughs> but yeah that's a really good point though um because at peak because i think um i can imagine it's quite rewarding doing your job on a personal level as well you know you having the experience that you have in the business and then seeing the new talent come through and you know being able to connect with them and you know i'm sure that you've 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 probably maybe learned some things from the new grads and the oh, new yeah. people coming through and it's, it's it's interesting how those connections work isn't it um yeah. but no it's, it's it's really nice that you offer that and you know that support for for all your grads and yeah. um, so next i'm going to move on to the the projects that you guys have been involved in and i'm going to come back to you kate if that's okay i know you covered slightly some some bits that you have been involved in but could you maybe tell us a bit about an experience or a project that has been your favorite so far um so like i said before i've done quite a range of things mm -hmm. um, but the current project that i'm working on is actually writing a, a, a hardware description language module for a new optical encoder. Um, so I really like coding. So this uh, is a really great project for me. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, this uh, has started at the uh, very beginning of the design process. So I wrote a design document, which describes the module, says what I'm going to include in it, how it's going to work, how it interacts with other modules. Um, and I'm currently at the stage of actually writing the code for that module. Mm -hmm. And right. once I've done that, I'll write a test bench uh, to test that module thoroughly. Um, and I particularly enjoy this type of project because I get to sort of go almost from the beginning to the end of a very small part of a very big project, but it's my bit and I get to, to do that myself and I'm in control of that, uh, which is really nice. Um, um, but other, other sorts of things that I've been doing as well. Um, so my previous 
placement. Um, I was involved in uh, the development of a debugging tool, uh, which is it going to be used internally, so this will never be seen by the customer. Um, but it really helps um, diagnosing problems um, that we might see in-house. Um, so that was a really interesting, slightly different style of project. Um, and yeah, the other sorts of things I've been involved in as well are dealing with component shortages. So if we have having difficulty with supply, okay. some existing products, we may not, we may struggle uh, to get them out onto production. So we'll need to find an alternative product to use and uh, component to use instead on that product so that we don't hold hold up those production lines. Uh, um, yeah. 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 So, so you've had quite the, a variety already, haven't you? Yeah, I've, yeah, you get to see all sorts okay. of things. Um, um, yeah, all the time, there's always new and different things to do. Uh, yeah. So, you know, you said earlier how you are interested in coding. Is that always been a passion of yours before you started Renishaw? Or would you say that's kind of a, elevated more since you've been here? Um, I definitely had an interest in it before, um, but I didn't think that it would be my absolute favourite thing. But yeah. now I've been doing a bit more of that. Um, I can really see that that's something that I'm really good at and that's something I really enjoy doing. Um, yeah. And, you know, I love that as well when that, you know, experience happens. And it's another great reason, you know, to be on a graduate programme because sometimes you get experience of things, don't you? You think, yeah. is this going to be for me? Am I really going to like it? And then sometimes it's actually one of the best and, you know, you really do enjoy it, which is, is a really good point. Uh, so thanks, Kay. Um, Annabelle, I'm going to come to you. Um, Favourite project or any project that you're working on so far? I know we've covered some of them slightly, but any experiences you want to share? Um, yeah, so my the very first role I did in the grad scheme was actually with a projects team. Um, so there are, were loads of projects that I really enjoyed. Um, one that I will talk about was really good because it's very simple to understand so I could get my teeth into it. No, not, not for your benefit, sorry. As in, when I started... <laughs> When I started, it was very simple for me to get my teeth into it. Um, so I didn't have to sort of, <laughs> I didn't have to sort of spend like a month just trying to get my head around what were we were trying to do. Cause it was, it's literally, we've got something, we've got a little ball and we're trying to dispense some grease onto it. Right. And at the moment it is quite a manual process. And what we want to do is just, just build a rig, a, a, a sort of uh, a tool that will do it for us. And, and yes. it's, the programming side was all done by um, a, a wonderful team that, that I was not involved in because that is not a strength of mine. Um, but I got to do very hands on. OK, what how fast do we want the thing to spin? Um, what pressure do we want yeah. uh, behind the grease dispense and things like that? So lots of trials and or what, what shape do we want the nozzle to be to make sure that we've got a really good uh, dispense? So, yeah, very hands on and, and lots of trials and things like that. Um, and then going in, Annabelle, what was the outcome? How did you do it? Oh, so I was so close to finishing it by the end of my six months placement. Um, but unfortunately, I didn't quite get it through the door just oh. before I left. Um, so it was handed on to the next grad who came in. Um, but we, I, I picked my nozzle, I picked my speeds, I picked my <laughs> pressure and all sorts of things like that. So, uh, yeah, it's making progress. Oh. You know, if somebody just tuned in now to the moment, I just said, yes, I picked my nozzle, I picked my speed. But I think, what on earth is she talking, <laughs> talking about? Um, so do you know if the, the grad who came in, Annabelle, have, have they succeeded? Is this, is this bit of kit in use? As far as I know, yes, uh, that was that was all put in there. She also, uh, bless her, had all of the jobs of the um, uh, admin side of it and making sure that the health and safety stuff was all up together with it and all of that. So she did a wonderful job of um, tying up those loose ends and getting it into the actual manufacturing cell. So oh, yeah. Brilliant. Sorry, Annabelle. So did she actually end up using your idea, or did she have to do it from scratch? No, so uh, so my one was taken on from uh, somebody oh, before there? me who had done the you know design teams further on, probably some design teams that Jonathan had had something to do with. Um, so it, it's it's gone back a little while, right? Um, but yeah, she did decide to to use the same the same values and the same um, uh, small parts that that I'd worked out. Oh my, yeah. That credit to that, you know, to yeah. that as a long list. Jonathan's with Piper Pins, actually, that was my idea. <laughs> <laughs> can, can we just, I'm just like, think, I'm just thinking about people's backgrounds here. So, um, just to give the viewers a bit of an idea. So, Kate and Jonathan, you're still working from home? Uh, so, I'm, um, I'm kind of on a hybrid split now. So, I'm um, partly at home, partly on, on site. Yeah. Okay, we're going to go into that in a bit, Jonathan, I think. But Annabelle, you've been in work, working from the office 
for a while now, haven't you? Yeah, so my my last placement, um, the last six months in the machine shop, uh, obviously we were in all of the time because that's where the machines are. Um, And this one, now that I've, because I'm just starting out um, and I obviously have a lot of questions, so I'm in the office all the time at the moment, um, but that will go into hybrid working in the next week or so as well. Uh, Okay, perfect. Thank you. Just just... Sorry, um, Becca, question. Is is that, if you don't mind me asking, I don't want to, to put you in a situation, but can you see that the that's going to be the way forward, um, the hybrid working for the foreseeable for Renishaw, or is that something you offer? Yeah, so it's a new policy that we've just brought in. It just started at the start of September, this yep. hybrid working. Um, COVID has obviously opened our eyes to different possibilities that we're able to do that maybe we didn't know we could do before. As yeah. I'm sure it has done for, you know, many, many, many companies. Um, so yeah essentially we've got depending on the role that you're in um, there's different types of hybrid working that you might do so for example if you were a graduate software engineer um, or on a graduate uh, on a software placement sorry you may only come into the office one day every two weeks Mm -hmm. um, depending on your team whereas other roles so um, like Annabelle in manufacturing for example um, if you're you know if your job requires you to be on site you will be on site for the, the whole time that you need to be on site for. Yeah. Um, or alternatively, you might do three days in the office, two days from home. Yeah. Um, so there's lots of different options available. But what we do stress is um, it is a new, as I say, a new policy for us. So we want to make sure that everybody is being supported in the, the most appropriate ways. Sure. Um, so our young talent coming in, you know, they, they need a lot of guidance and support. And so they will always be supported by somebody else in the office at the same time mm-hmm. if they're in the office. So they won't ever be there on their own. Um, and, you know, like Annabelle just said, it's really important, especially when you rotate um, or you're coming into a new position. You're going to have lots of questions to ask. You're not going to necessarily know who to ask. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So it's very much a case of for our early careers people, we do want them to be on site as much as possible um, for the support element. So a little bit of both, and it does depend on the team that you're in. So as a graduate, when you rotate every six months, you might do one set of hybrid working for this six months, then you may go into another team and they may be doing something slightly different. So you then fit in with that team's hybrid working mm-hmm. um, and so on. So it's quite, it's quite flexible. <laughs> It's quite flexible, Becca. Sorry, Jonathan, I haven't forgotten you. It's quite flexible, Becca, but then, you know, the expectation would be that the students would need to live relatively close to the office as in commutable distance. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, we wouldn't necessarily, as I said, because especially if you're a graduate, every six months you're, that yeah. situation might change. Um, and we're all contracted to be in the office. So if we're required to be in the office, we have to be able to get there. Um, yeah. So we would still need students to live close by. Um, what we found this year where it, where we were just implementing it um, a lot of students were asking that question to me yeah, so you know awesome. am I how much am I going to be working from home do I need to you know spend the money on relocation mm-hmm. etc um, but I th- as far as I know um, the majority of our graduates have relocated to the area they're living together in either Bristol or Gloucester or some of the smallest towns around um, and they're still acting in the same way that they would have been had they have been working in the office full time uh, you yeah. know prior to COVID so yeah definitely still uh, need to be willing to relocate to the area if you're not local. And the next question on the tip of my tongue is relocation and do you help with that at Renishaw? So we don't financially help yeah. um, but what we do do is we create a Facebook page each year mm-hmm. um, so we put all of our graduates and placements into that Facebook page before they join the company um, mm-hmm. and we give them the opportunity so we give them information about like the local areas and which places are nearby um, if we need to have individual conversations, we chat to people about, you know, what type of lifestyle are you looking for? If you're coming from a city and you still want another city, then Bristol or Gloucester are your places to go. But mm-hmm. there's around our head office, if you're based sort of around our few sites around the head office, um, there's also lots of smaller um, Cotswold towns and villages, which, you know, if you're looking for that, there's that kind of thing as well. Yeah. And the other thing it does massively rely on is people's um access to transport so whether they're driving you know whether they're walking cycling um we are not connected at all by public transport Mm -hmm. um so people do really need to be able to drive or be prepared to live sort of in the countryside um and either walk or cycle or motorbike or whatever that might be into the office so that's something really important to I like to stress it and every candidate I speak to I talk to them about it because I think that 
uh, a lot of young people think I must be able to get a bus that's that's ridiculous there, there will be a bus but there really isn't yeah. <laughs> unless you want your commute to take about three hours uh, <laughs> one way then uh, yeah <laughs> to our head office definitely we're very remote so uh, something to bear in mind when you're doing your research on Renishaw. Thanks. But, but the benefits of that is that it's a beautiful area to um, to actually work in. So uh, a lunchtime walk outside the office is is not mm. full of fumes. It's full of countryside and it, it is a great area. And, and our manufacturing sites are also located near Stroud as well. So um, mm. there is opportunities to sort of visit or live in that sort of um, uh, Cotswold uh, town, as you suggested. Yeah, oh, it sounds like my dream. Jonathan, we need to get to you. Favourite project. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I um I basically had kind of like a, a big project per rotation kind of thing that like yeah. I think stood out for each one. Um, so I feel like I was going to go through those kind of quickly because um they were all very unique and different, um, mm. and that's kind of why I like them all. Um, so the first one I was um it was looking into testing how different stylus materials, so like the, the bit on the end of the nib of like the probe. Well, like you know, stylus for a phone, or whatever. Um, how that, no, that one. yeah, <laughs> how that, <laughs> yeah, how that interacts with different test piece materials. Um, so like common manufacturing materials like steel, titanium, um, alloys of the kind of the kind. Um, so that was a very much a hands-on test and data heavy one. Um, so kind of formulating, oh, what, how should we test this against this, and for how long, and what are we going to use, and what's the rate of success, and so on. Mm -hmm. um, second project was lo basically looking into how temperature affects um, gauges that measure strain, which is just uh, the change of length of an object when compared to its original length when put under a force. Um, and so we had a cantilever beam, which is just a beam on one end, and it's then freely kind of got a weight on the end. Um, and looking at how the gauges change with temperature and then trying to figure out and understand that. Um, the third one was a very typical mechanical engineering role, which was redesigning a system, um, the kind of the internal workings of a system, a lot of moving parts, um, trying to improve its lifetime of the product. Um, probably can't go into too much detail on that one, but that, there's a lot of bits and bobs inside. Um, and then the final one was um, a bit more kind of document heavy, looking into uh, verifying the design of um, cabling, which had like armor on it. So it's more robust um, mm -hmm. to damage and fluids and so on. Um, so the design was already there, but it was kind of verifying it and making sure we didn't miss anything and looking for risks. I can just imagine you all like, you know, like a crazy science project. This is what it sounds like, doesn't it? Every day. This sounds like a I, I feel job. like that when I go in the lab, so I'm like, oh, yeah, get my, get my coat on. Yeah. Oh, gosh, it sounds so much fun. Yeah. So, what are you going to say to me? No, I was just going to say, so you've, you've come to the end of your graduate program now, Jonathan. That's right, mm -hmm. isn't it? So, yeah. how did you decide what? Um, full-time job that you were going to go into after the program what we did was it was did you have to reapply just go through that whole process with us um so I have an equivalent <clears throat> of Pete um for our mechanical coordinator um mm. so um he helps us um he has kind of interviews one-on-one -on -one asking us um well more of a chat than an interview just saying what have you enjoyed um okay. and ideally can you name a top two if not three if you love them all um, to kind of help him decide, um, match the graduates' needs of the business needs. So mm -hmm. departments tend to have a number of slots that they can take, and mm -hmm. that does depend on the year. Um, and uh, yeah, you just kind of you just quite honest. You're saying, "Oh, I enjoyed this. Don't want to do that again." And that <laughs> happens. Like it, unless you're very lucky and love every single one. And that's the benefit of having all these rotations. Is you kind of one will stand out. Like, oh, oh yeah, and I like that one. Um, and then also the graduate network is quite strong, um, both through housing and also kind of the socials. So um, a lot of the time you can talk with your fellow graduates and kind of iron out if there's like clashes over placements and you can kind of agree amongst yourselves. Mm -hmm. I know, for, especially for this year, there wasn't really much turmoil in terms of deciding. Um, and uh, yeah, so I was lucky I got my first choice as well. So oh, yeah. congratulations. Mm -hmm. So what? So what's the future looking like for you then? Are you in... You know, do you have you got plans for the future where you want to go to in, in the team that you're currently in or what what's I know you've just you've just started so I hate asking a five-year plan question but what what's in store for you over the next couple of months um so I I've got quite a long-term goal in the background um 
of getting chartered as a yeah. mechanical on the IMAC -E scheme, mm -hmm. um, which Renishaw has the supported registration scheme. So I have a mentor at Renishaw that helps okay. me with that. Yeah. Um, so I know I've been here for, for two years now. So that's um, normally it takes about four to five before you're ready to apply to be chartered. So yeah. I definitely you know want to keep building up that profile in the meantime, like kind of identifying areas that I haven't quite covered yet or could be improved. Yeah. Um, so I'll definitely be kind of asking for those opportunities at work and in the team that I'm in. Um, but then besides that, I think it's just kind of really get to know the area that I'm in because the good, the benefit of rotating is you're seeing loads of different things. And I guess the drawback is you can't quite get your teeth stuck in as much as you might like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, sometimes it takes years before you're really, yeah. <laughs> you know, you're seeing all the changes, like, like, it's like Annabelle said, um, seeing the changes that you've made and you want to kind of ride along with them. Um, mm -hmm. So I think, yeah, I just kind of want to become like an expert in my area, um, maybe look into kind of the senior roles and so on. So. One day you can be like Pete. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah it is a dream. <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> you heard it here first, people. One yeah. day we're going to have Jonathan's oh, going to be like, like Pete. Oh, oh thanks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how sweet is that? Annabelle, what's, what's, the, what's in store for your future? I know you've just started your, your second, your other next placement, but what is the, what is the grand plan? Don't um, say to be like Pete. <laughs> <laughs> That's a cop out now. Yeah, I want to be like Pete when I grow up. Um, I've got two placements left um, after finishing this one. So obviously I've got six months or just under six months left on this one. Yeah. And then I've got a secondment, which um, similar to how Jonathan was just saying, will be a discussion um, with uh, my stream coordinator on what would I like to do? What are the business needs? And, and see um, where I end up with that. And then I've got my final placement, which will be... Um, supervision so it's more of a managerial role it's um looking after a specific manufacturing line and looking after the operators who are working in it oh. um and things like that so uh looking forward to that one i think it'll be uh lots of new challenges yeah. um and we shall see how that goes um but yes yeah, so that that'll be that um and then uh, doing what Jonathan has just done and, and seeing where I want to end up, which at the moment I have no idea because I've enjoyed them all. So yeah, we shall yeah. see if I can narrow it down to my two top. I'm not sure I will. Yeah. Oh, good. Just, just enjoy the journey, isn't it? Just yeah. get, get through this. See bit. what happens. So, yeah. so when you are looking after, the, the, how many people will you be looking after in your last placement then? Have you got a, a team of quite a few that you're going to be the boss of? Um, I mean, these guys probably know better than I do if they've seen it happen for other grads. Um, it, I think it depends on which which manufacturing line I'm looking after, really. Um, yeah. And it's very much done in conjunction with um, uh, other people. So I might be going into a role and having someone who uh, also oversees my manufacturing line, but has a lot, a lot of other ones that they oversee as well. Um, so it will be very much supported and, and things like that. But I don't know yet. We shall see no. what happens. Watch this space. Oh, it's so yeah. good that you're also supported, especially, you know, Jonathan from your charity panel as well. And Annabelle, you know, what the future holds in store for you. And Kate, what are your plans? Um, so sort of similar to Annabelle and Jonathan in a way. So I've got a year left of um, the graduate scheme. Yeah. Um, I'm already starting to look towards chartership, so I already attend um monthly meeting um, of people who are at different stages of the process um, oh, okay. which has been really helpful um yeah. so i there are some people in that group who are, uh, have already done gone through the full process and there's people who are uh, sort of halfway through their application and people like me who are right at the beginning um so that's been really useful to see how that process works yeah. um and uh actually sort of in work um i'll hopefully find a, a sort of permanent role where, which I really enjoy, mm -hmm. develop my skills uh, even more. So sort of probably narrow down my uh, school base a little bit, but really focus on some skills that I really want to develop. Yeah. Um, and hopefully eventually be involved maybe in the slightly um, high level of design. So the more conceptual stuff, mm -hmm. um, I, I think I'd really enjoy that. Uh, so, but yeah, we'll see, it's, it's yeah. all still uh, to play for. Yeah, definitely. It sounds like you've got some really good opportunities coming up and some grand plans to look forward to in the future. So thanks very much, Kate. Um, right. Well, I've got six minutes left and I'm just thinking, Becca, <laughs> I, I love you to bits, my love. I really, really do. Um, I'm just thinking the application process. What I really want to do, 
because we can put that on the hub, but we can't talk about teeth and bones. No. So can I quickly go to <laughs> teeth and bones? And then if we've got time, Pete, you've got like two minutes, my love, and I'm going to come back to you, Becca. But if not, audience, we're going to, we'll, we'll put the application stuff on the hubs. It's all going to be there. But come on, Pete, teeth and bones, go for it. Go on, go on then. Uh, so just, uh, it is brief. Um, so we have been involved with cranial, maxillofacial and dental <laughs> products. So um, they are... Um, the regeneration of metal parts to replace bone structures. So if someone has unfortunately had an accident or there is some bone disease, what can be done by surgeons and obviously with our assistance is we can replace bone structures with titanium. So it, it can be very, very intricate, the obviously the, the features of a, of a bone uh, reconstruction, particularly in, in the, uh, the facial area. Mm -hmm. So it does mean um, the surgeons uh, have to um, identify what structure needs to look like, and then we can actually reproduce that in our additive manufacturing machine. So building it up and actually printing titanium to make that structure, which can be replaced in a, in a patient's um, a bone structure. Now, now there's uh, obviously there's there's some real medical um, um, uh, difficulties with obviously the the human body accepting uh, metal um, and titanium has been uh, uh, um, a metal which can be accepted but again it takes the surgeon's skill to identify how that structure actually needs to be created and we can reproduce that but the important point is it's not us just making that that metal piece what I, is important is that we've actually designed the machine to make that yeah. metal mm -hmm. so it's involved all types of disciplines from anything from the mechanical engineer who's got to make the structure to actually hold the powder um, to guide the the uh, laser system um, we've got the electronic engineer that makes the control system to motorize and move the in any of the the features um, within the machining center, which includes uh, gyros to reorganize and, and um, direct the, la the laser itself. Mm -hmm. um, we've got software engineers that have to create this, the individual software to take the, the images that the, the surgeon has created from a CAD model and actually um, put it into step movements for the laser to actually um, melt certain parts of the metal in a precise uh, manner so that it's built in, a, in precise detail and made up to to a structure which can actually uh, ensure that it stays together and then of course we've got the physicists and uh, chemists who understand the the, the the makeup of that metal so it's engineering the actual product not the outcome but the outcome is so good that it's worth talking about yeah definitely and just like so many people are involved in the whole process out there all the way through like you mentioned physicists mm. mechanical engineers electrical engineers electronic engineers it's just fantastic opportunities that are available. Um, so thank you very much, Peter. I had to come back to that. Becca, we have got a minute. <laughs> I can so, do it in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I know you can. I've got every <laughs> video. Um, you go for it. Yeah, so application process, uh, just visit our website or go through the links on Gradcracker when they're live. Um, takes you through to our platform called Workday. So you'll make an application through the system. Mm -hmm. For our summer and industrial placements, it's um, uploading a CV and a cover letter. And then you will be invited to a technical interview um, that will either be virtual or face to face. We're not quite decided yet. Depends. We need to see how the COVID restrictions continue. Um, but hopefully we're looking at probably towards the end of the year, start of the new year for those interviews. Um, and then for our graduate opportunities, it's exactly the same. Visit the links in Gradcracker or on our website. Um, again, you need to upload a CV and a cover letter. But for graduates, you'll be invited to an assessment day and that will be structured with a, an introduction um, all about the company and what we've got to offer. You'll then have an opportunity to do a um, group assessment where we're looking for your softer skills and you'll also have a technical interview. And again, this may be virtual or it may be on, on site. We're not quite sure yet. We're hoping we can get people back to site because it's such a fantastic place yeah. to show off. Mm -hmm. um, and we really want to bring people back in to show you. But we'll just have to see how it goes um, over the next sort of month or two whilst we're deciding. Um, mm -hmm. And that is it. So very simple, straightforward process for us. It's just if it's a, a placement you're looking for, it's just usually the one interview and then we'll give you an outcome. For the graduate schemes it's your assessment day and then we normally come back to you within two weeks with an with an offer or a regret mm -hmm. um and then 
it's all wrapped up in, in just quite a straightforward process, really. So no, no testing, no psychometrics, nothing like that. It's all just a CV and a cover letter. So make sure you put lots of emphasis on those for us. Yeah, definitely. Remember what me and Becca said before about mentioning the webinar, mentioning your research. You know, Pete chipped in there as well with all the all the hints and tips that they've given you. So yeah, make sure you really thoroughly research Renishaw before you put your applications in. Like Becca mentioned, we will be opening um, their opportunities on Grad Cracker in the autumn. So after the webinar, click the follow button to be alerted via email and push notification. Do not miss out. It's a company that I would want to work for if I was intelligent enough. Um, <laughs> but in my next life, I might be. Who knows? Um, so thanks, everybody, for, for joining us today. It's been an absolute pleasure to meet everybody at Renishaw and for, to have you, the audience, um, tune in again. Next week, who have we got, Jess? Next week, we have got Atkins, um, our, our friends of Grad Cracker, massive engineering product and management company. So, yeah, see, see you all next week, same time, same place. But for now, thank you very much to Renishaw. Yeah, thank Thanks you, everyone. Thank you. thank you, everyone. Bye -bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. Yeah.